Are you ready? Yes. All right, good. So for the last several months, we have been in a series that is going to take us 12 months to complete. And uh, we have been talking about the hero challenge and walking through different aspects of our life that we want to take time to recognize that this one life that we've been given by God is something very precious and something very valuable. And we don't want to waste any, any time, but we want to redeem the time and be purposeful in every area of our life because we recognize that sometimes as people who follow Jesus or go to church, we think that spiritual life is just one facet instead of the entire portion of our life, re recreation, relationships, emotions, all of it, which God cares about deeply. And we want to be able to, to take some steps towards really discovering what God designed and, dis and, and created us to be and do. And we recognize that it isn't just in coming for information uh, every Sunday that we, what, we actually become transformed into what God has for us, but it's by taking action, by taking steps in our physical life to be able to uh, recognize that God has given us, and the Bible says that, it, that our bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit. And as we begin to believe and step out in, on the Word of God and recognize that there is some incredible things that God has for us that we could begin to discover really the hero that He's made us to be. And Sarah did an awesome job. I got a chance to listen online preaching last week on the subject of prayer. One more of the tools that God has given us to be able to completely transform and to be recreated and to be redeemed into what He has for us to be able to discover that He's given us a communication and a language to be able to talk to him and to be able to have a relationship with him. Now, a few weeks ago, I had an opportunity to go to Phoenix One, and uh, there was a special guest speaker who was sort of incognito, and for those of you who don't know what Phoenix One is, that's okay, but it is a uh, kind of a gathering of 20 to 30-somethings down in the heart of Phoenix, basically uh, brings together about 130 plus churches, and it's for really the millennial generation. And uh, so the 20 to 30 young professionals come together. And so there was a guest speaker who's kind of been highly sought after by the name of Francis Chan. Anybody ever hear of Francis Chan? If not, he wrote a book called Crazy Love. It's great. I can see you're very excited about that. Um, <laughs> But while we were there, he introduced me, and we know Francis uh, very well because he used to pastor a church where we grew up in Simi Valley, California, and kind of remember when he just started, and he used an illustration many years ago, and he did the other night that sort of uh, kind of stirred me again, and so I wanted to share it with you because it's really going to sort of pave the way for what I want to talk to us about this morning. So he was just talking about how incredible creation is, and he was going through just really kind of giving us some different pictures and examples of how amazing, if we stop and just think for a second how incredible it is right now, we're spinning on this massive globe, and just all that's taking place in God's creation is just amazing. And he went in went on to talk about the caterpillar and uh, was just saying, you know, imagine the life of a caterpillar, right? Just sort of going along, just crawling on the ground, and all you ever know is dirt, and you're just sort of going along and just sort of inch, inch by inch, just sort of making it day by day, and just, like I said, just sort of rolling around in the dirt. And then, then one day you take a nap, right? You take a long nap, but you take a nap, and when you wake up, you just, you know, something's different, right? And all of a sudden, you go from being this caterpillar who's crawling on the ground, and all of a sudden, you know, you wake up, and you're like, shut up. And you, and you, have, you have wings, right? And, and all of a sudden, you go from being this, this ground-grubbing dweller to soaring and beautiful colors. I mean, can you, can you imagine what is sort of coursing through the mind of this new butterfly? And so he was talking about becoming a new creation in Christ. And in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, let me read this out of the New Living Translation. This means that anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. The old life is gone, a new life has begun. Weymouth translation says this, so that if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creature. The old state of things has passed away. A new state of things has come into existence. And so drawing on that picture, you know, he sort of was bringing everybody into a recognition that 
A caterpillar, once he sees that he has wings, I mean, he does not spend the rest of his days imagining how he could go back to sort of inching by and sort of going through the dirt. And so it is with us as people who have come into the reality of what this passage of Scripture talks about, that God has loved us and poured out his love upon us to such a degree that we have literally become new creatures. Just like the caterpillar who becomes a butterfly, we have become a new creation. Now around my house, we, we don't use this term, shut up. I mean, I, I forbid my children from going around and telling each other to shut up. They get timeouts and all kinds of punishments, spankings and things if they use those terms. But around here at E3 Church, we like to take things that sort of culture makes negative and we like to spin them for the positive. So the title of my message today indeed is Shut Up, right? Here's why. Because we, we now, it's become very cultural if, if, you know, two young ladies walk into church and one sees that the other has on a brand new pair of shoes that she is super excited about. When she sees those shoes, she says, shut up. Look at those. Those are fantastic. And so, with that in mind, I want us to use this term as an exclamation or an exclamatory response to the reality of what has taken place in us. If the butterfly looks at his wings and says, shut up, then we should recognize the reality of what the Word of God says about us and who we are in Christ, that this book that we've been given, the reality of it, is not so that we could come and just sort of talk and sing ditties and just be people who are forgiven of our sins. There is way more contained in these pages than that, right? And we're gonna, we're gonna take the next several weeks to begin to explore and to experience who we have become, who we have been made as a result of the reality of the relationship and the union that we have in Christ Jesus and I believe there is only one proper response when we begin to hear who we are in Christ. Shut up, right? Let's start. Romans 5, 17. For if by the trespass of the one, death reigned as king through the one, much more shall they who receive the abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness reign as kings in the realm of life through Jesus Christ. Shut up. Are you with me? I don't think you're with me yet because there is a knee-jerk reaction. There is a response that is, should be elicited as a result. There is an excitement. There is an enthusiasm because the same enthusiasm that takes shape in the caterpillar to the butterfly that needs to encompass and grab our hearts. But I think we've become inoculated to too many church doings, church building doings. We know here at E3, we are the church. This is just the place we come and hang out on the weekend and sort of do a pep rally. But we're the church. But sometimes we have minimalized and we have missed out on the reality of who we are in Christ. And so the inferiority and the insecurity and the uncertainty seems to dominate our thoughts, seems to dominate our lives. And rather than recognizing that, how much more shall they who receive the abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness reign as kings in the realm of life through Jesus Christ. God created us, right? That we have been remade, we have been reborn, we have been born again into a kingly or queenly state. And we are accepted by God to reign as kings and queens in the realm of life. Go ahead and say it. Yes. I mean, God, he redeemed us from sin but then he imparted his very nature into us. 
Now, I, I might have to bring a few passages of Scripture to, to your remembrance, or maybe for the first time I may be bringing some that you haven't even heard before, but there are so many passages of Scripture that reveal to us the reality that God has imparted His very nature into us. And that very nature should change the way that we think. The Bible says that we've been given the mind of Christ, that you and I should operate and we should live in a different place, in a different confidence. Not confidence in and of ourselves, but a confidence that comes in the reality of understanding who we are in Christ Jesus. Now, as I said before, most of the church is aware of our forgiveness of sin, but not on this union with God. I mean, not on the, on the vital union that has been secured, that we have become sons and daughters of God, that we are now not conscious and aware of sin, going around worried all the time about whether or not we make a mistake and feeling shame and guilt and coming back up to the altar and saying, oh, I'm just a worm, I'm just a nothing. No, you can shut up to that because the reality of who, you've been, who you have been transformed into should bring about a confidence and an air and an understanding that you were created to reign as kings. Not as dominant rulers, but as one who have authority and dominion. That the very nature of God lives on the inside of you. That you have been empowered by grace. You've been empowered by mercy. That the love of God lives on the inside of you. And gives you the power to love the unlovely and the unlovable. Now, this year is a reminder for me. And our 12 years uh, of marriage, uh, especially for this year, has become just... It's, it's amazing. But one of the things that has really resonated this year for my wife and I is the reality of, of this relationship receives its fullness when I and she begin to allow the love of God that is resident on the inside of us to actually project onto one another. Because you may not know this. I'm sure those of you who are married realize that there are moments of disgruntledness with one another. There are moments of, of um, uh, let's say, just not the fullness of the relationship. But this year has been an, quite an experience for me. And you can preach words. I can come up and share messages. But, but this year, I, I feel like there, there has definitely been a, a rocket ship of, of revelation. I'm just making stuff up up here. Uh, let's write this down. In, in our relationship, just to, to recognize that I, in my own strength, cannot love th the same way that when I surrender and allow God to love through me, it is a pretty powerful thing. You have that on the inside of you. You have the ability to love your spouse in a supernatural way beyond anything you can comprehend or imagine. Shut up, right? Right? You, you, there, there is a power resident. Now, you may not have become awakened to it. You may not be aware of it, but it's there. Like undeveloped property that's sitting off on the side of the road, then somebody comes along and builds some monstrosity, and you're like, shut up. That used to be horse property or whatever it was, you know? It's the same with us. That, these, that this reality lives on the inside of us, but I believe that God wants us to be awakened, and wants us to not live in insecurity and inferiority and uncertainty. That you were crafted by God to live in a God confidence. As a God man and a God woman. Not conscious of the devil. Not conscious of sin. Not conscious of weakness and insecurity. I mean I grew up uh, in my life in church and hearing songs where we would sing that we were just, we're nothing. You even heard a song that we switched the words today because there's just something just specific when we're singing that how I don't want us and S Steve doesn't want us to, to, to miss out on, right? Because in, in the song that we sang, it, 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 the actual words are, my life's nothing without you. But instead, we want to sing, my life's everything with you. I can concentrate on who I am without God, and I'm, I'm lowly, and I'm weak, and I'm 
a nothing and I'm whatever. And, and we've heard that in the church for a very long time. But wait a second. Wait. The flip side of that is who am I? Who has God made me to be? Do you wake up every morning and are those the first thoughts that hit your mind? Who am I? Who has God made me to be? Or do you look at the financial reports and and all of the the things that you're bombarded with on a consistent basis so that you can allow your heart to sink into fear and insecurity and wonder what will happen? Oh my God, oh my God, what will happen? Well, this right here gives us a picture into what has already happened, right? Right? And instead of us trying to get something and be something, we've passed that because you have become something. You are something. Look at someone say, you are something. You were created in Christ, right? Galatians 6.15 says, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision means anything. What counts is the new creation. So if, if that's what counts, then where should we set our mind and where should we set our attention and what what should we be allowing to to be the dominant focus of our thoughts, the new creation? Who are we in Christ? Who has God made us to be? As a result of what Jesus has, has done for us, what's taken shape? Spread our wings and let's begin to soar into what God has for us. Are you with me? 2 Peter 1, 4 says by which he has granted to us his precious and very great promises so that through them you may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped from the corruption that is in the world because of sinful desire. Partakers of the divine nature. That sounds pretty lame, doesn't it? No, it doesn't. Shut up. Partakers of the divine nature. Are you with me? Like, that's... That's a pretty awesome statement. Do do you walk in that awareness? Do you recognize that you have become partakers of the divine nature? That inside of you is the seed of the supernatural. Inside of you, the same love that caused Jesus to be moved by compassion, that caused Jesus to speak to lepers and to cripples, to speak to... people that, that were infused with guilt and shame and sin and was able to bestow upon them grace and mercy and become known, obviously, as the God of second chances, the God of love. That same love lives on the inside of you. It's vast. Being a partaker of the divine nature isn't only for us to be able to just experience just in, in this area or that area. It's in all areas. And it's time that we began to stoke the fire to recognizing it, that we would begin to walk in a a newness, in the reality of who we are so that we could recognize what God has done for us. Can I get a oh yeah? Yeah. Colossians 2, 16 through 17 says, Therefore, let no one pass judgment on you in questions of food and drink or with regard to a festival or a new moon or a Sabbath, These are shadows of the things to come, but the substance belongs to Christ. So in other words, sometimes what happens when we don't see or aren't experiencing the transformation, this is definitely something we could all identify with, especially within the church walls, when we aren't seeing and experiencing what I'm talking about, when we aren't on a daily basis coming in to that vital union where we're bringing our brains to a recognition of what is contained in our heart. We settle for mediocrity by becoming people who want more information in church. We do. And then, I'm sure you've never heard this. I'm certain, you know, it's been on rare occasions that I've ever been in a church where someone said, I just, we just need deeper teaching. And I'm sure you've never been a person who, who said that or, or we just need more of this or we just need more of that or if they would just do this, da, da, da. now I'll say it, shut up. The, the reality is, is that I've watched over the years that the, the thing that causes that is because people want to settle for information more than they do transformation. 
They'd rather have the appearance of things taking shape because it takes energy and effort to actually get your brain to recognize that you are a partaker of the divine nature. So instead of us becoming the fullness and experiencing life more abundant, we would rather just talk about it and just have information. But you weren't designed to do that. You were designed for action. You were designed to be a hero. You were. By the very core of your nature, you were designed to exercise the love of God that has been shed abroad in your hearts by the Holy Spirit. And without it, you will become pseudo-transformed and think that coming to activities of church means transformation when we all know that that's not true. What creates transformation is when we allow our wings to spread and we allow ourselves to recognize, dang, I am looking good in Christ. <laughs> I'm clothed in Christ Jesus, right? Shut up. There needs to be a lot more of what I'm talking about uh, shared between us as we begin to recognize what has happened as new creatures in Christ Jesus. That old things are passed away. We can spend our time on the old things being passed away, right? And we can come every week and just become sinners saved by grace. Wait a second. Behold, all things have become new. Th there is that second part of that, right? That there is something new that has taken shape within us. That God has uh, done a work in us. Now, the awesome thing, if we look at really what the, uh, the Apostle Paul has written in the Pauline epistles, is the revelation of this super genius, divine revelation of who we are in Christ. He spent his time as a person who, who tried to please God on the outward, doing all kinds of crazy things. But then he had a moment where he was transformed. And that transformation led him to pen the Pauline epistles. And they are the most dominant, most amazing passages that give us a living picture of this substitutionary. Are you guys with me? Am I, the, am I just excited about this? I guess I am. Had some caffeine, so that must be it. I just must had some coffee, and I love Jesus. So, um, but the transformation is real, and the reality is there. But we don't want to be undeveloped property. We want to become the fullness of what God secured for us through His perfect substitutionary work in Jesus Christ. You have par become a partaker. That means that you don't have to live as a caterpillar on the ground. You don't have to live thinking in uncertainty all the time and worry and being anxious about things and fear, letting those things dominate. But you can begin to evoke by the very words that you speak by allowing your speech to come into alignment with the word of God. And you can allow yourself to take on the vocabulary of what it means to be a partaker of divine nature. Colossians 2.10 says, I'm complete in him who is the head of all principality and power, lacking nothing. Say, shut up. Shut That's up. right. Ephesians 2.5, I am alive with Christ. Romans 8.2, I am free from the law of sin and death. Isaiah 54, 14, I am far from oppression and fear does not come near me. <laughs> I am holy and without blame before him in love. I have the mind of Christ. I have the peace of God that passes all understanding. You're saying it wrong. Don't tell, you're, you're telling me to shut up. I, I have more time. I have the greater one living in me. Greater is he who is in me than he who is in the world. Shut up. I have received the gift of righteousness and reign as a king in life by Jesus Christ. I have received the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of Jesus, the eyes of my understanding being enlightened. I have received the power of the Holy Spirit to lay hands on the sick and to see them recover, to cast out demons, to speak with new tongues. I have power over all of the power of the enemy and nothing shall by any means harm me. I've put off the old man, I've put on the new man, which is renewed in the knowledge after the image of him who created me. 
I have given, and it is given unto me, good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. Men give into my bosom. I have no lack, for my God supplies all of my needs according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Telling you it's some good stuff, right? We have the opportunity to recognize that we've been made new creatures, new creations, that the old is gone and the new has come. And if we don't spend time to give attention to the reality of who we are, then we live in the inferiority and the weakness of who God gave his son Jesus for so that we wouldn't have to be living in that. And I want you this morning to just think about that as it relates to all that you encompass in worry. Maybe there's new businesses that are starting. Maybe there's new paths that you're taking. But when we start to step into the reality of who God has made us to be, and we start to give voice, and we start to give attention, and we start to begin to meditate, and we start to allow the meditation of those words become pictures that we see, then we begin to take on and walk out the very reality of who God made us to be. We are not just mere sort of people just walking by. We've become partakers of the divine nature. God wants to use us in a way to draw our hearts, draw from our hearts, compassion and love, goodness and mercy and favor. And he wants us to bestow it because he's called us to be ambassadors, ones who are sent out on behalf of the kingdom. And this kingdom is about goodness and grace, love and mercy. It's about second chances. And it is about being able to walk in the fullness that God has provided everything for us according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes with me? Heavenly Father, we thank you so much that the entrance of your word brings life and light. God, this morning, we allow our thoughts to come into alignment with the reality of who you've made us to be in Christ Jesus. Father, we thank you that we are partakers of the divine nature. That in us, Father, is your love that's been shed abroad by the Holy Spirit. Father, your mercy, the ability to, to treat others beyond what they deserve. Father, a newness, a passion to be able to look out upon the world around us and to walk in a confidence because we know that we're loved and we know that your love is inside of us to love others. God, I'm asking you to do a work in our hearts this morning. Would you allow us to wake up to the fullness of who we are in Christ Jesus? Would you help us to grasp that we are not weak, emaciated, inferior, regardless of what has taken place, because the old is gone and the new has come. Father, this morning we reach out to respond to the goodness that you have graced us with, the righteousness that you have bestowed upon us, not by our works, not by our efforts, but because of the finished work of the cross. Father, this morning we open up our hearts, we open up our minds, to be able to see that we are indeed sons and daughters of God, that we are loved, and that you have given us all things that pertain to life and godliness in this time, for this moment. While every head is bowed and every eye is closed, if you're here this morning, and maybe you don't have a, a relationship with God, maybe the result of poor decisions, maybe whatever it is, it doesn't matter, but because of those things, you feel like God is far from you. But the truth is, is that God never leaves us. He never forsakes us. And this morning, we just want to take time to just be able to pray and be able to connect you to the vital union of the reality that Jesus shed his blood. He gave his life as a perfect sacrifice and rose from the dead so that you could have the fullness of life as a son and as a daughter. And if that's you, would you shoot your hand up really quick and say, that's me. Would you pray for me? Thank you. you put your hand down. Anybody else here this morning? Say, that's me. Would you pray for me? Right, awesome. We're going to pray this out loud together. Everyone loud, say this with me. Say, God, thank you for loving me. 
Thank you for sending your son Jesus to shed his blood, to die on a cross, and to rise again so that I could receive freely the gift of sonship, of daughtership, to be loved by you, to be accepted by you, to become your child. Thank you for that. I love you. In Jesus' name. Simple as accepting the fullness and the freedom that's there. And the next step for us, those of you who raised your hands or should have raised your hands, is to begin not to, to try to, to become something different, but to discover God's love and begin to respond to it. Allow your heart to begin to take steps towards saying, you know what? If God loves me this much, if he cares about me, I'm willing to hear a little bit more. I'm willing to, 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 to give up my ideas and my thoughts and my pain and my hurt and my sad story for newness of life so that I can begin to experience the fullness of what he came to give me, which is life beyond my wildest imagination. Has anybody in here experienced the old and then experienced the new? And you'd say, there's some good stuff over here on this side. In the seat pockets, in back of you or in front of you, there is a card. For those of you who want prayer or you prayed that prayer with us this morning, please make sure that you fill out the card so that we have your information because we want to take steps with you on the journey that is beginning to discover God's love, God's goodness. Thank you. I'll be quiet now.